balls. I gotta shut lights off. And, and we are live. Good morning, as usual. Happy Friday. Shutting lights off here. Yeah. Giving us some. Oh, there we go. Some mood lighting. Bow, bow, Morning, bow, bow, I see you bow. in the chat already. <clears throat> All right. I'm personally just waking up this morning. So. Yeah, me too. <laughs> At least I look semi awake. That's normally the problem. It's like I swear to God I'm awake. I swear you look to, I like swear you've been awake for like three hours. Yeah, I swear to dog I'm awake. <laughs> Hello, hi Parker. Parker. We'll give people a few minutes to filter in. It's obviously early on a Friday morning, and <laughs> some suckers actually have to work. Is this thing all tap tap? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> Oh man. Makes it even better. It's like I said, official vacation after today. <laughs> Finally eating these tiles. She has to grab a mouthful of food from her bowl and then bring it in here and drop it on the floor. And then eat it, yeah. And then eat it off the that. floor. Blurry camera hides the sleepy eyes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Man. We're not blurry, are we? Yeah, I mean it, I don't think it'll be too long before we get blurry, but it's 34 and drizzling here in North Carolina. I want to go back to bed. It is one degree here in yeah. Kansas. And my watch actually says minus zero. There you go. Minus zero. Is that even possible? Yeah, I don't know. Minus 13. zero. Ah. All right. So it's cold regardless. Um, talk a little bit. We'll have a little bit of a. So what you shot 690 last night and. Yeah, you almost snapped me off. Didn't, didn't even yeah. sniff like <laughs> anything. No. We were down on the opposite end, or I was down on the opposite end of the world from all the. You were only were you 15, 15 16? 16. Yeah, I was right okay, there. So you weren't too far away. With the spread out and everything. Yeah. So we were just. Yeah, so I shot uh, shot 792 last night. So I upped my high set by one stick. Boom. And uh, just as I was, we were starting into game three after game two had kind of a rough end. I had front eight the first game. I had front seven the second game. And I went like seven pin, eight or nine pin, seven pin whiff in the 10th frame. I overthought that one a little bit. Oh, whiff? Yeah, so I, I opened the 10th frame of the second game. But this is after going uh, front eight, flat seven, picked it up, strike, strike stone nine front seven and then i had one that there was uh, that guy that was on my pair that was throwing plastic the the lefty oh yeah the, the high and so that didn't even really register until the very end of game two and then i made the adjustment for game three and was fine right um but yeah just those last couple frames that second game because i thought a couple of those should have gone the one in the tenth for the seven in the tenth frame should have gone and that uh i think it was an eight pin but I went just a little bit high on and didn't get tripped out. That should have gone. So, did you leave a nine at one point? Yeah, that I was. I thought I saw a nine, but that maybe. Yeah, a nine. Ball or something. Yeah, it was a fill ball in the yeah. first game. But we were just getting done with that, and I was telling the guy we do three dollar brackets. We normally have twenty, twenty five of them. Was there nine last night? Huh? Was there none in you last night or something? No, there was a bunch. There was still twenty, twenty five of them. But uh, so I go, you know, Tommy asked me what I shot, and I said, uh, you know, two forty six. He's like, I think that may get run over. And so about two, three frames into the third game, here they come. 300, Mark Martin. 300. Trevor. Uh, yeah, Trevor. 300, Jeff 300. Poston. 300, 300, Tyler Lawson. And a couple of those 300s, the second game, pushed in the brackets. Oh, so yeah. imagine having to shoot 300 just to not get through a bracket, but just to tie, to get through, yeah. to have a chance. <laughs> We had four, yeah, four 300s in game two. Yeah, there were three. four 300s. Game Trevor, two. Game yeah, two. game two. Trevor ended up shooting uh, 300, 290 the last two for 837. So that's 23 of the last 24. Not too shabby. So, yeah. Um, On one and two as well. Shooting, yeah. Apparently one and two is like. Yeah, one and two apparently is going nuts because. Last time we bowled on one and two, I had 760. And yeah, well. Usually garbage for me so. that's where i shot my 791 yeah, that's right. at the beginning of the year yep. so yeah apparently one and two is like the magic pair now because there was jared freed shot 760 something oh then two of those on the same pair on the same pair yeah yeah, yeah two, same game yeah so. posting and uh trevor yep. and then tyler lawson was on three and four which i think that's that's crazy 
Yeah, three and four sucks. Yeah, three and four is the worst pair in the house by a long shot. Because I think Trevor, twenty five and twenty six pretty damn close. <laughs> Trevor shot something like six fifty or six sixty on three and four last week. Yeah, so that is bad then. So it's on the left side. Woof. So yeah, yeah, it's a little crazy. Yeah, especially after Hirschman shooting eight sixty a couple weeks ago too. So yeah, craziness, craziness. But yeah, my last uh, my last five league games are seventy nine, sixty eight, seventy eight, forty six, sixty eight. It's pretty solid. Oh, and Bree shot 760 another wall. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys want to score? Come down here and bowl in Lawrence. Yeah, Poston got him one game. Well, James shot 790, the only 791 or something, the only. He bowled Jared that night. Time he's bowled uh, in league in Lawrence. So. Their house shot is great in Lawrence, and not only is their house shot great, it's for the woodpins carry phenomenally there. Yeah. Unless you're on three and four or twenty five and twenty six. Twenty five and twenty six it's just bad. Yeah, yeah, the dragon rams. It's the curse of the dragon is guarding the carry, apparently. It's where they put all the dragon rams. Yeah. All right. So anyhow, I said last week that we were gonna talk about direction this week, but we're changing directions because I have direction. So plot twist. The plot thickens. Yeah. So have a lot of questions for videos all the time of um, you know, uh, people that just don't understand core dynamics or layouts or, you know, ball cover stock types, which I think that's the hardest one to get. Cause once you get RG and differential and all, all that other stuff and get a basic understanding of layouts, yeah. that's one thing, but, but knowing the, the cover names and what that means as far as how they relate to everything else, right. the cores are pretty easy to keep track of. And luckily enough for us, Storm and Roto Grip is fairly consistent with, and some people would say, oh, well, they just, they're just not coming out with anything new. They're just playing Mr. Potato Head, but it's very helpful. There's a lot of companies that kind of rename stuff, or they, they change the formula, they tweak the formula a little bit, yep. and they call it something completely different, where Storm calls it, you know, R2S versus R2X versus R3S versus, so they, yeah. if it's in the same form, if it's in the same formula, formula family, then they kind of do that so that you can relate them to each other. And there's some familiarity when you go to drill something and yep. say, okay, well, aren't you? And they don't really go out of their way too much to explain the differences, but at least our three S and our four S you're thinking, okay, well, that's going to be an evolution or they're going to be stronger or something. You're still going to be in the same ballpark, but it's just, yeah. Gonna be, you know, so you kind of understand what you're what you're getting at, but cover stock cover stocks I think are the the toughest thing to kind of get down and understand. Yeah. Okay, well this ball has you know traction MFS on it or something. It's like what is how does that to a person buying a bowling ball that can really confuse the crap out of people too. I can yeah, because a lot of it's marketing yeah. and a lot of you know people said something about the. The, the tensor core and the insight looks kind of like the the trisphere from the optimus and it's mm -hmm. like well there's only there's been a million light bulb light a, a million variations of the light bulb core too because there's only so many colors for a bowling ball there's o only so many core shapes and core shape to a certain degree is marketing too they kind of get the numbers they want and jazz it up a little bit and then right, you can yeah. get into rg planes and all kinds of nutty stuff that i don't even get into but basically even if one core is shaped a little bit differently from another core and there's they still have similar numbers the numbers are what you're ultimately going for so yeah 900 globals cover stock numbering so the higher the number for global stuff the higher the number the stronger the cover stock formula is so that yeah. that helps to a certain degree track used to have a naming system that was something like that it was a little boring but it was effective but at the same time people didn't understand it at all like well, track the, went through that phase where everything was like 720x so yeah yeah the bowling ball it was like Six, 607 a i think that the first number was the first number was hook potential the second number was something else on the names so, of the bowling balls yeah i never realized that yeah i can't tell you i've ever thrown anything track yeah, the first the first number was the hook potential, and then the second number. So they had like the six o or they had the three o three a. A was for angular. S was for smooth. T was traction. So if they had like the nine nine twelve T or something like that, that, that is, was freaking strong. That is just nothing but confusing. Yeah, yeah. 
So, <laughs> what are your thoughts on all the so-called ball comparison charts by other people? Uh, it's rough. And again, even the stuff on the storm site doesn't make any sense at all. So I'd see. They, I would hope that they're still in the process of updating that because if you're trying to tell me that a trend is significantly stronger than an IQ Tornado Pearl, that's just inaccurate. See, I think uh, I think motives. Is, have you have you seen motives? It's, yeah, it's actually pretty good because everything Mot left to right, left being smoother, right being more angular, and I think they they hit it pretty good on the head with it. Yeah, some of their stuff they they miss the. They miss on some of their lower stuff, like the Venom line is a whole lot stronger than they say. Yeah, it's like Venom the, Shock the, is the like Venom the Shock is oil. like is not smooth at all. That's like hilarious. Just, yeah, the yeah, and it's not smooth. It's it's pretty flippy. Um, Roto Grip had a pretty good one when they were doing when they were doing their charts. And I think some of them still float around out there somewhere, but yeah. it just shows that um, even if you, I mean, sometimes you just or it. it at Storm HQ, I don't know how much they actually practice on other stuff. I know that a lot of those, a lot of them, they have to get out and bowl somewhere else, but they use uh, AMF SPLs, which are lower friction yeah. than what most of the country sees. There's not a whole lot of SPL houses out there. And so that's why everything, if you ever buy a Storm Ball after watching their video and you think, well, gosh, this it has so much more back end. For Storm, or for them at Storm than it does for me, or it goes longer down the lane. Like every, I watch one of those videos, it's like, well, everything's going to hook three or four feet sooner for me yep. and be a little bit smoother on the back end the majority of the time. Or something like the uh, the UC2 that looked like it just kind of wiggled all over the place for everybody in their video looks pretty amazing for everybody else but Jason Eubanks. <laughs> <laughs> Jason can't stand his. But he, and he's, he's really... Um, He's really disappointed because he loves e all things e tracks And so, you know, we were kind of worried about the UC2 because it looked like it just wiggled all over the place, but you get it out in the, yeah. the real world, I guess. And it looks great. For, I've seen some people really make that thing look good. Man, it looks great for just about everybody. James shot um, 300 with his and close to 800 or something, James. Angel threw hers, I think, was it last Friday night? And yeah, Angel really threw hers last really Friday good. night. looked really yeah. good. I threw mine for a handful of games at, in, uh, at Lunar last weekend, and nothing looked good. So Nothing looked good. I, I, Trevor labeled the rack the whole day, and he couldn't carry anything. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't carry anything, but average 250. That's what the just, funny thing was. I just don't remember. that. Yeah, it's just talent. I mean, I, well, that's what I was going to say. I don't remember it going that way because it looked like he shot 190 the first game, and then it looked like he struggled the rest of the day, but he literally <laughs> averaged 250 the back seven. Because every single game was 240, 250, 260. When you fry out multiple times in a day, averaging 250. Yeah. Yep. Love the training day thumbnail. Yep. We're going back a little bit. I haven't seen that movie in a while. I that need to go back so and watch that. Sunday. I can't believe that. Yeah. I know we don't do ball talk, but Scott wants to know what, what yeah. your thoughts on the intense fire was. Yeah. And some of this, we, we're going to do, we're not going to do like specific ball propaganda talk. We're going to do, this is still going to be more on the theme I really did like the intense fire and that's what um, I'd like to hope or I'd like to think that or take some credit for something like the phase three where I just after the intense fire came out and people were kind of so so on it. I kept bugging Chad McLean about it and I said, dude, this cover is this covers nails. You need to use our 3S hybrid on something else, anything else. And that's and what was, the intense fire is, right? That's, that's what the intense. Right. Uh, yeah, that's what the intense fire is. And so um, just like a week before they announced the phase three. I was on him again and I said, dude, anything, anything, one of these bigger cores, something like, uh, you know, put it on the, the centripetal HD core, which was the Sonic supersonic core. Cause those were kind of yeah. out at that time. And I said, do that. Or how about the velocity core? People have been wanting a phase three for a long time. And R three S hybrid phase three would be not so good. And everybody would buy it. And he's like, and he's just, like, Oh, would you be, would, Oh, so you'd be uh, you'd be pretty happy if that happened, huh? And he kind of kind of gave me one of them winky faces. I'm like, oh heck yeah. That means you're bringing something. Coming yeah, through. yeah. So I never yeah. personally got along with uh, the phase three. So yeah, it, it's one of those where the R3S hybrid is kind of sensitive to friction, yep. and so it's one of those that's going to work really well when it's you know when it fits and it's going to throw fits. Yeah. When it's not matching up, so. Gotcha. Mm. 
This is a great question from Joe Brennan. Have to give him credit here, James. <laughs> What's the best way to teach illustrate to a novice that a strong ball doesn't mean more dynamic back end? And that's why Fantastic I decided to question, start yeah. doing, you know, the next several weeks, we're going to talk about all this stuff so that we can actually talk about it instead of trying to make a video. Because if we're making a video that somebody's just watching and answering or asking questions after the fact, it's not near as helpful. It's not near as interesting. And it's going to have to yeah. be several one hour videos to kind of, to kind of get anything, uh, get anything accomplished, and yeah. nobody's going to watch that kind of video. They'll watch a live stream and they'll ask comment or they'll ask questions, and we can have an actual discussion that just isn't possible with a video. And I'm like, well, I can't fit that. I can't illustrate a lot of this stuff. I can't show it. Um, I'm actually not even using the board boxes anymore. I got those, and those just didn't work out at all. Number one, they take a while to set up, but they are they are very sensitive but they are very accurate because they're very sensitive. They're great, but just not for videos because then people start looking at just the numbers on the box and without any context. I had that second, I had, I made two board box videos and the second one was, you know, board box issues or board box training or, or something like that saying, okay, well, both of these balls hit 14 at the arrows and seven at the break point, one struck, one went high. What happened? And people will look at that and it's like, oh my gosh, that ball must be really consistent if you're hitting the same spot. And it's, it's yeah, like, well, no, I dumped it or I got around it too far or I didn't hit it at the bottom or I threw it faster, I threw it slower, whatever else. So just seeing numbers on a box wasn't terribly helpful and it caused more problems than. Pretty cool though. Yeah. It's a great tool for practicing, I think, if you're by yourself or for the for your practicing. Yeah. And that that's the other thing is that um, I did one on surface prep saying that, um, you know, for anybody that watches NASCAR or any kind of racing or whatever, even if you, you watch dirt track racing, NASCAR, whatever else, it would be like thinking that more hook equals more back end thinking that, okay, well, if I take my stock car and put dirt track tires on it, well, those are more traction. So we're going to get more traction. The NASCAR fan is going to go like, no, those are softer as snow tires or something. Those are softer. They have um, big old treads on them so that they can dig through stuff. But there's actually less when you have that tacky, fresh, nice asphalt mm -hmm. out on those stock car tracks. What you're doing with a snow tire is you're reducing the amount of surface area in contact with the roadway. Right. And it's the same thing in bowling. You have to pay attention to what you're actually thinking about. You want to sand a bowling ball to dig through oil because it's microscopically textured. You can't really see it. Correct. It looks rougher and it doesn't look as shiny, but you're creating microscopic peaks and valleys, basically like tire treads to dig through the oil. But when it's digging through the oil and getting more track, getting actual traction through the oil, when it hits the friction, there's not going to be, and when it hits hard friction at the back end, there's not going to be as much of a difference because it's already gaining traction throughout the entire lane. And then when it hits the back end, well, it there's not the surface area in contact with the lane. It's still the ball is still basically riding on all these, you know, spikes or peaks in the yep. peaks in the cover stock. So it doesn't have as much surface area to contact the lane to begin with. And a bowling ball, the the, the actual width or surface area where the bowling ball is actually touching the lane. Fun fact, it actually doesn't even touch the lane at all. It rides on a bed of uh, negatively charged ions, but that's, Boom. yeah. Now you're really geeking out on me here. Dropping the knowledge. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the thumbnail training day. Exactly. Probably use the snow example, and he just did. So, oh yeah, and Scott, yeah, given given how much everything else looks, maybe, so he was, I sent him that promotion, he was uh, bending that from third arrow. Like and on the on the left side, he was bending third arrow with a pro motion last night. So Joe said that. Mm -hmm. uh, no, then he so yeah, you can like probably that. use the snow tire example. If you go back and find that surface tutorial that I did, it's got a picture of a snow tire and a, a snow tire with like the UFO and then a um, oh, racing um, slick with the phase I three. I remember seeing that video. Yeah. So yeah, when you have something shiny like the phase three and cover stock types there again, we're going to talk about that some, but that's something else that's tough to get in there because one shiny ball does not equal another shiny ball. Like 
Supra versus the Trident Nemesis versus yeah. Um, so one shiny ball or yeah, plastic that shiny doesn't okay. hook at all. Um, unless you're Jim Anderson bowling me last night. Looking, looking plastic. Yeah, he actually had to move. He actually went to reactive the last six frames of the last game, but. Well, you would never throw plastic there, but whatever. Mm. He hooks it a lot, and he's got that pathogen, that pyramid pathogen plastic ball that actually looks pretty good. It flares a little bit, and I don't think it's plastic plastic because it actually hooks a little bit. So it's probably got one of those modified weight boxes. Yeah, and I didn't really notice much lane transition at all last night. And with plastic, if it was plastic plastic, I would have ran into, run into problems. All shiny balls are pretty. Some don't yeah. smell great, though. But um, Especially if it's a motive ball. They do not smell good at all. <laughs> Fresh out of the fresh out of the factory, they're like spray paint is what they smell like. But any shiny any shiny ball number one, it's gonna hydroplane on the oil because it's not gonna have any peaks or valleys on the cover stock to get any kind of traction. And so it's just gonna spin and spin and spin. But when it gets to friction or it encounters dry area of the lane, all of a sudden it's got all kinds of surface area. It's you know, it's maxed out on the surface area in contact with the lane, and so it can grab and grab and go. And so that's the idea that hook and back end are actually opposite. Not only are they not the same thing, they're actually the opposite. If you want more back end, you need a smoother slash shinier surface. Because it's going to push through the oil and then it's going to respond quickly. See, off the and drive. that's another thing, too, that a lot of people like plastic, for example, they don't realize that plastic can actually act like urethane down lane and creates push. Just, yeah. Just like a urethane ball will. Yeah, because it has yeah. nothing to do with cover stock type. Yep. You can actually tighten a lane up just by throwing a corner pins with your. It has something ball. to do with cover stock yeah. type because if the ball does not absorb any oil at all, but I mean, it, it, the ball's not going to absorb oil fast enough on one revolution yeah. or one or two revolutions to all of a sudden not just dump oil all over the back end. So if you get the bowling ball back, and we'll talk about this, I'll, we'll kind of reset here in a minute. You follow yeah. up with. Because we were talking about Joe's stuff here in a second. Yeah, I suggested he polished his sanded solid ASIN because he's not getting the down down lane recovery with it. And he said, I'd never do that. Yeah, so you're just fighting a losing battle there, I think. Yeah. Because some people just do not theoretically get it that they think that making the ball hook more is making the ball turn harder. You, That's the first thing that you have to disassociate is that hook and back end are opposite things. Yeah. Because hook is not the ball motion you see on the back end. That is back end hook is actual traction and so that's that's a um caused some problems in the pro shop before i remember some somebody came in and they're like i want to i want something that i need hook i need hook i need something strong i need something that hooks a lot doesn't every customer you know a <laughs> tommy thompson yeah okay it was tommy thompson came in back when the scandal came out Oh, so that's and a while that's, ago, yeah. Yeah, that's what, that was a while ago, but that was one of the strongest balls out at the time, and he liked Hammer, and yep. so I'm like, okay, well, this is perfect, because the Scandal just came out. It hooks a bunch. You want hook. You like Hammer. Here you go. We're drilling off a Scandal. Well, he gets out there, and he's playing, like, fourth arrow with it, and the first, it looked pretty decent in practice, but by the time he got to the end of the first game, it was kind of wiggling and pushing and wiggling and pushing, and he came back in, and he's like, man, this, this thing is, he's like, I thought this thing was supposed to hook, and I'm like, well, yeah, it hooks. He's like, well, it's just, it's just really smooth down lane. And so I'm, I can't, it's not coming back. And, yeah. and so I watched him a couple shots and I'm like, well, I said, I mean, it's hooking, but it's just, you're way too deep and you're expecting way too much out of it down lane. I said, if you just move right a little bit, it's going to hook and then it's going to be controllable. And he's like, well, I wanted something to really peel off the spot and go. And I said, well, that's not what you told me. You said you wanted something that hooked. He's like, yeah. He's like, I wanted something that really, you know, got down there and made a big move on the back end. And I said, well, that's not hook. <laughs> that's not hook at all. That's the opposite of hook. Uh, and so, you know, after that, I, I learned to ask the question. It's like, well, do you want hook or back, back end? end. Yeah. Do you want something to be difference. really strong and yeah. smooth? Or do you want something that's going was to... Was the scandal? That was... Was that pearl? No, it was that green. Well, they had a scandal pearl. But the first scandal was like green and blue or something. And, and then service? the yeah, and then the Scandal Pearl was green and silver or something. Because there was like a Scandal and a Scandal S? Yeah, then there was the Scandal S. Okay. But the original Scandal was uh, was green. Okay. I'm sorry. All right. Yeah, that's, he was probably pretty pissed. So, yeah. Saying. Yeah, there's a big difference. People, uh, 
it's not to knock anyone, but they just don't, yeah, yeah. They don't know the terminology. They don't well, know. They just it's just more learning the physical or the the technical side of the game. Well, and he he learned something out of it too, and he he throws it pretty good. So it was just yeah, once just, we got on the same page, and then I I said, okay, well, um, sorry, this was kind of a miscommunication. But he ended up really liking the ball because I told him, yeah, just. I like sometimes the big back end balls and he was going through a stretch where he wasn't really doing so hot, but he was standing too far left and he was trying to get everything yeah. to peel off the spot. And so instead of moving, he just wanted something that was going to peel off the spot harder. So he'd get more consistency down lane, but that doesn't happen at Westridge. The, no. the problem with West, the problem at Westridge is always playing too deep. Mr. Two eight. <laughs> So yeah, it's one of those things where, and James can tell you, the bowling at Westridge really fakes you out because you'll have this dynamic, not so look in practice, and then all of a sudden the ball will start wiggling at uh -huh. the spot. It'll start wiggling, it'll start wiggling, it'll keep wiggling, and so most of the time what you have to do is you have to ignore what happens at practice at Westridge and then move right because the back ends are really, really soft and slow. Yeah. So that's most of the time people's problem at Westridge is they get faked out by practice and then the ball starts missing the spot and it keeps missing the spot the rest of the day. But then you've blown up the heads and so then you get the little wiggle in the mid lane where the ball crosses your track if you move right. So it's like if you get it in a little bit, it stops and goes. And if you get it out a little bit, it's still going to wiggle and yeah. wiggle and be soft because all of a sudden you have to throw it harder now to get it down the lane but then you have to somehow get a tip on the back end. And that's just been the paradox at Westridge period. Not to mention it's just been stupid. Weather but, here lately. I mean, yeah. Well, that's the case here. Well, that's exactly what happens at Lunar. That's exactly what happens at Lunar. Well, is in practice and back ends tighten up. See, I didn't on the right side on uh, Sunday. I didn't think the back ends tightened up. The, that it didn't actually happen, but they yeah. modified the, here you go, Tobias, you'll love this. They told us on uh, Sunday that USBC actually made Lunar put down more units because last time they were there for the doubles tournament, uh, all the lefties complained that they, it was just too dry. And so USBC actually made Lunar put down more units. After that tournament, wasn't it? Yeah, after yeah. that tournament. And so the more units ended up still being just dry as hell. I'm playing fourth arrow with the UC2. Didn't they just put more units in the heads? I have no idea where they put them, but they didn't put them on the left side of the lane. I they don't think put they them put them on the right, on the right side. side either. The right side actually just hooked and hooked and hooked. But once you got deep enough, like well, you were you were rolling it really nice yeah. on at that tournament. But Dylan had a heck of a time. Dylan had no look all day. Because the ball yeah. just hooked in his backswing. And then as soon as he moved left or tried to, you know, bump his speed. And it's the same thing that happened to me is I got deeper and deeper and deeper. Yep. And all of a sudden it got too steep. And then... I went back and started throwing it harder, but if you get it out too soon, it's yep. gone. If you get it in a little bit, it just kind of wiggles and pushes. That's so. why I was able to grab like the jackal flash where it was kind of more round instead of skid flippy. Cause I mean, I could have moved left with, and fought the skid flip, yeah. but it would have been real touchy. So just that round motion was able to. Yeah. When you get into that situation with a strong hooking ball, what's the best move? Generally the best move is to actually move back right and be softer with your hand. There's a lot of, especially the, the older school bowlers that are used to, um, late 90s, early 2000s equipment used to being able to still hit the ball. Uh, even once you got out of the, the urethane days, you had the, the tried and true urethane players that just want to use it and can only use like the low end reactive stuff. But then you have the people that were kind of in the middle there with the 3D offsets and the um, the pulses and the surges and the um, the aftershocks and all, all the stuff like that, that that hook, but that you could still hit. Now this newer stuff, you really can't hit. You really can't hit it. The best way is to just lay out of it and let it work. And that's why I thought you did really well on Sunday at that tournament. You were throwing the jackal flash most of the day, and then what you've been doing with the ghost the last couple of weeks at both houses really. I, I grabbed that and moved left at one point. Yeah. Oh yeah, but you were still you were still rolling it and getting out of it really soft and letting the ball actually do the work. And I think this newer stuff, the easier you get out of it, and that's what's really helped me on the I'm left. I'm starting to figure that out more and more. I'm getting more used to it. Mm. So I know I threw the first first ball in practice with the venom shock, and the ball hooks at my feet, and I'm like, oh no, yeah, what am yeah. I doing? Oh man. Oh. The wicked burn. James says, move right, be soft with your hand. What is this nonsense? What is this nonsense? Angels. Or just move left into a ten. Yeah, Amanda <laughs> said she saw practice. 
because I was live streaming and she saw the ball hook at my feet and she's like, uh-oh, it's going to be a long day. Mm -hmm. So I just kept inching, inching left. Yeah, and it was just... It was rough. Yeah, it was a rough day for for us, everybody but Trevor, and even Trevor got walked on. I brackets forgot, too. I, I forgot how to spare anything on the left side of the lane. Oh, so. my God, and I, I couldn't spare anything. I went three for four on seven pins last night, and the one that I missed was just because I, I way overthought yeah. it. Because the last couple had... You know, I've been letting go of the ball and letting it kind of yeah. walk itself out and just kind of fade into the seven pin, yep. and that absolutely did not work on Sunday because the lanes were so dry. It'd get down there and then it'd hook and it'd get down there and it'd hook and everything that Royal Crest, Royal Crest, North Rock, all the places we've been bowling, I can just kind of let it walk into it almost like a plastic ball. Nope, everything hooked there. So, and that's the one thing too to go kind of back where we're talking about with the where you, when you get in that situation with a strong hooking ball, what's the best move? You said yeah. sometimes it's right. Yeah. And yet, but you got people that their physical games, I don't know if they're fully ready to be able to just soften and stay soft because a lot of the people that want those strong hook and bowling balls they yeah. want to get up there and just grab yeah they it. want to get up there and claw it yeah. and that's again that's like the ops like the hook and back into the opposite yep. that's one of those opposite things where they want something that hooks but they want it to hook so that they can get deep and wrench on it yep and i don't know i i had some pretty good weeks just kind of floating the my floating my crux prime yep. up the boards at at uh, Westridge and my synergy at Royal Crest, I have not gotten inside of second arrow in weeks because I just let it, it's, it's got tons of back. It'll clear the fronts. It rolls like an idol. So it just kind of, I can kind of just float out of it and roll at the spot and it walks up and it's kind of like Westridge. The yeah. easiest way to do it is just get right and just be nice to it at the bottom. And you really don't have to make many moves. No, no, because I mean, you're, the ball is never going to hook. Yeah. I mean, so the only thing that you have to worry about is the heads holding up, which yep. they actually have been this year as opposed to last year. The problem is that, hey, you don't get any hook down lane, but you don't have to. Last year, the last couple of years, it was one of those things where once the ball started hooking on the head, then you had to move to get it down the lane, but then it wouldn't really, yep. it yep. still wouldn't do anything down lane. But this year, you're just not having to move. So. Idle synergy looked great for Troop this past weekend. It looked great for Luke. It always does. Yeah, it's just that one I think needs the shine knocked off of it too because that and the UC2 came out of the box really, really crazy glossy. But on higher friction lanes, it looks pretty good. Angel hated hers, and I'm actually, I actually need to go out there and finish plugging it because I started plugging that the other night. Yeah, the way you throw it, I so, put, it, put that one in the left side back too. Ever think you don't have to? Yes, that's a that's a big factor. Everything you don't have to move. Exactly. Well, and I, I was talking more about the righties not having to move. He still has the right side. I, yeah, lane. I still got the right. So I still pay attention to yeah. what's going on on the right side of the lane uh, because I don't really have to pay attention to what's going on the left side of the lane. Once I figure that out in practice or the first game or two, then all you, all you have to worry about is just making the shot. Yeah. As long as you get up there and make the shot, which I didn't do in the 10th frame last night. Well, I did that on the first ball, but the second one, I I'm I'm excited to see how you do it, Aaron's, for the Tour KC, the next one. I won't be there. I'll be at uh, I'll be at the Southwest Bowl in Wichita, but they're actually going to bowl on something short. Yeah, 37 feet is board, or Broadway version 2, so it's yeah. short, but it's almost 27 mils, so it's going to be really, really interesting. So I'm going to take a whole bunch of different – I'm going to – Take some your thing. Yeah, I'm going to take uh, pitch black, fast pitch. Uh, I'm going to take my two inch MVP attitude yep. and then I'm going to drill that crux prime, my righty crux prime that I have sitting there mm -hmm. forever that I haven't, I think I, I don't even think I finished the, I cut it and I never finished the plug. I don't think it's ready to drill yet, but I'm going to actually drill that because I think that's going to look great. I know my uh, desert tank's mad at me because it wanted to be, I was like, I saw 37 yeah. feet and I'm like, no, I think the zero gravity is going to go because that that's, it's an older ball. So it's starting to smooth out a little bit. Oh. oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I forgot about that. Next Friday, we have our tax appointment in the morning. So either coffee stream gets delayed or we don't do that one next week. We'll probably just skip it. So we can do it later. I don't but, care. I'm yeah, we might do it. Yeah, vacation. we might do it later. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we might just do it later once everybody's actually awake. We could actually do a lunch stream. Something different. Yep. And that's actually where we're. Uh, so, yeah, I'm taking a bunch of crazy different stuff. Um, you were talking about ball numbers like understanding RG and diff. Earlier, what are the first steps to understanding? And so that's where we're, oh, we're on a CA, so all day is tax appointment. 
Sweet. We've got a really good one here locally that we go go up to in Holton. So. Like understanding RG and diff earlier, what are the first steps understanding when you need a ball with X RG or Y diff? Actually, it's a great question. Actually. Yeah. So let's uh, liquid lunch stream. Yeah. I'll do that. Is there a bottom line or a minimum number for rev rate? I have no idea what mine is, so I'm sure it's not very high. Not really. I mean, the the ball. The most of the time the rev rates are higher than you think they are, even if the ball only spins a couple times on the way down the lane it's still going to be 100, 150, something like that, because you're talking about the number of times that a ball will make a full revolution in a minute. Then so the ball only takes a couple seconds to get down the lane. If it, you know, if it spins like five times in three seconds or something, that's still going to end up being in the 150s, yeah. something like that. So I don't have a big rate rate. So. But Joe, going back to that, that's what we were going to reset. And you, uh, see, you want to start with uh, yeah. what is our, what does RG mean? Start with the basic. Mm hmm. So, all right, so training day. So we're going to start with this, and all this information is on the box. RG stands for radius of gyration, and the simple way to, you can look that up. It's a scientific term, but um, you can look that up. It's The information is on the front of the ball boxes. I don't know what the exact USB-C specs are. I think it's like 2.46 to 2.8 or something like that. Very rarely will um, you see some balls like your uh, Venom recoil that we drilled last night. Um in Lawrence, not at my house. Yes, in Lawrence. Because I don't have a turbo bit. Anyhow, be on the up and up here, people. Don't get any ideas. Um, but that one's got a 247 RG. I think um, there's only been a couple balls that I remember that had a 246. I think the supercharge was one of them. But basically, the lower the number is, the closer the weight is to the center of the object. So so if it has a higher RG number, what does that mean? If it has a higher RG, it means that the weight is spread more evenly throughout the ball and a lower, and really it's the their measurements. So it's the difference in the height of the ball versus the difference of the weight of the, or the, the width of the ball. And the more that difference, the more imbalance you're going to have in the core and the more flare potential it can create. So, uh, so that's why something like the uh, the IQ Tour is 249, 029, and 15 pounds. And so that's going to create a early revving, uh, rollier type of look that's smoother on the back end because it doesn't flare a whole bunch. Most of the weight is more centrally located um, it's kind of a rounder shape. Another, again, the centripetal C3 core is another kind of variation on that light bulb type of idea. It's got the central, the rounder central mass of that core, and then it's got that little puck on the bottom um, that helps create a little bit of differential. But basically, the easiest way to think about that is like if you watch figure skating and they start doing towards the end of the routine when they start doing the spins, yeah. when they have their arms out, that creates a higher RG. So they spin slower because they're actually moving some of their weight out away from their body with their arms. But when they pull their arms in, they're creating a lower RG and they start spinning faster. So that's the easiest way to look at that is that a higher RG ball is like a figure skater spinning with their arms out. And a lower RG ball is like when they suck their arms in and start spinning really fast. So a lower RG Again, more centrally located um, weight. And so that's going to make the ball want to rev up, roll, uh, and hook essentially sooner versus a higher RG ball, something like a high road that takes longer to get kind of spinning up. It's like 257 RG. Which is and, pretty high. Yeah, which is pretty high. You can go, again, USB-C, I think, says you can go all the way up to 2.8, but you're not going to see anything above. Like, yeah. even the Wild Streak is 261. Mm -hmm. You're not going to see anything any higher than that. The fights at 262, or I think, were the highest that I've seen. Uh, until you get into lighter weight balls or super, super weak stuff, there have been some stuff I've seen like 265 or 270, but, that's, but you might as well not have a core in it at that point. So most of the RGs that you're going to see in kind of a workable range are like 246 or 247 to about 258 ish. Um, the wild streaks are kind of a 
um, exception. And then what about uh, what's the diff in a ball? But even yeah, but even the even the wild streaks have that central ball. The core is a little bit smaller, and somebody challenged me on this, but density has something to play in there too. So even the the core technically measures out higher RG. It has a central, it has a denser central ball that makes it want to rev up just a little bit sooner than you would think that a 261 ball would actually rev up. So, um, and plus they had a, they basically had their version of the phase two cover stock on it. Differential is the next one. And that relates to the difference between the vertical height and the horizontal width of the bowling ball is really what the simplest way to explain that. And the more the imbalance there, the more uh, you actually create imbalance within the ball. And so that's why you see balls with higher differentials will come back with the oil rings on the ball. You see the oil rings on the ball. The idea for higher differential bowling balls is to create more imbalance, which creates more flare, which spreads the distance between those oil rings out. So what happens is that there's, when the ball rolls, there's two different spots on the ball called the bow tie where those flare rings actually meet. There's one on the top and there's one on the bottom of the, there's one on the top and one on the bottom of the ball. And so the less a ball flares, the more it elongates those bow ties. And so uh, when people talk about urethane and plastic creating carry down, that's more because they don't flare very much than, you know, because something like a black widow urethane or a hot cell is not going to create any more carry down than a, another similarly strong cord ball will because there's a, the balls are flaring a whole lot. The bow ties are really, really short and there's just no, the ball is not rolling over the same oil track. So there's no way for it to deposit more oil onto the back end. Urethane and plastic just don't absorb like stronger balls do. So if you continue to, you know, you know, if you can continue to throw a ball, most of the time, by the time you get up there five minutes later in league or in a tournament to throw the ball, some of the oil has actually soaked into the ball with reactive stuff, but with urethane stuff, it's just going to sit there. It's not going to go anywhere. Yep. So as you throw a urethane ball without wiping it off, it will, no matter even black widow urethane will create more carry down than something like a UFO. Right. But it's so marginally minimal that it doesn't even really make, difference. make a yeah. difference. It's not even really worth talking about. So typical urethane balls have very low different. Oh, Scott. Thanks, buddy. I actually had a good question up here. Somebody asked. Uh, Donation. Making a $5. ball change versus making adjustments to your shot with the same ball. How do you know when you get out of the ball before adjusting too much? Honestly, it's really what you're seeing down lane. I mean. Yeah, it's, it's and it's, it's experience. This yeah. is the toughest thing that I get asked. How should I drill this ball? Or, yeah, thanks a bunch, Scott. That's. Really appreciate you hanging out. You're pretty active in the Discord. I need to be more active in the Discord, but there are so many channels on the Discord. And every time I go back, it's like there's this and then there's this. And we have a food channel. We have a nutrition channel. We even have a motive channel now. Come hang out with us in the motive channel. Hush, hush, yeah. Yeah. We even, I even have a motive channel for the motive heads in my, uh, my storm channel. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can Riley. You can come hang out with Swift Cookies and I'm. So yeah, come hang talk out. Talk motor balls. Yeah, it's not just just goes called Storm Nation. It's not a propaganda and marketing. Really, Andrew, so. to an finish answering your question, it's more of what you see. You know what you're seeing down lane. Uh, also, is it going through the pins the right way? Uh, are you leaving lazy corners? You know, agreed. Yeah, it, it's a lot of that. Yeah, and that's and that's what a lot of them say is. Yeah. Uh, let me see the the lane. Okay, I, I've got to remember how this is said. The ball will tell you what the lane is doing. The ball, okay, the ball will tell you what the lane is doing, and the pins will tell you what the ball is doing. So I'll say that again. The ball will tell you what the lane is doing. So you throw the ball and you see what kind of reaction you're getting. The pins will tell you, yeah. Now, how the ball is hitting the pins and going through the pins will tell you what the ball is actually doing. So just because you know, just because you have great ball reaction does not mean that you're does not, gonna yeah. It does not mean that it's going to go through the pins the right way. Okay. Or, you know, you can see. That's throwing. another part of the game that a lot of people get misunderstood. Yeah. And some bit. of it's experience and it's. Really, I'm hitting the pocket all day. How come I'm not carrying all? Because you have wrong ball motion, buddy. Yeah. If the ball's not going through the pins the right way, you can, you can hit the pocket 
with virtually every ball in the bag on a league night. Oh yeah. Even if it's hooking too much or not hooking enough. And there was a, so, all right. A few more questions that I wanted to get to. How can you tell when the ball is hooking right at your feet? I'm trying to learn why stronger stuff is hooking too early. The, that's also a good question because most of the time people target like the dots or the arrows. And so if the ball starts up before then, you're not even going to catch the ball in your sight line before it crosses your target. Because if you go to throw the ball and you're looking at the arrows, you're not going to see anything that the ball does for the first 15 feet no. of the lane. Sorry. Pull that off there. You want to play with the ball, Mistel? It's okay, baby. Hi. I know. You're a good doggy. Mm-hmm. But um, most of the time, if the ball looks like it's kind of DOA, if it just kind of hits the pins and it's really flat or it's not making a move down, making enough of a move down lane, yeah. sometimes if the back ends are sharper, you kind of want it that way. They'll count. People will count on the ball burning up and kind of dying to yep. kind of control the back end motion. Uh, but most of the time, if the ball just is late on the back end and just hitting like a marshmallow and deflecting and going the opposite direction, ideally, you kind of want it to finish hitting the five. I mean, the perfect way for the ball to go through the pins is for it to hit the one three and the five nine and kick the five into the eight. So it kind of hits the pocket and goes straight through. That is about the best. Uh, ball reaction. You don't necessarily want it just cutting through. That everybody thinks, oh, continuation. Well, you do want a little bit of deflection. Unless because, you're on twister pins. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you do want you do want some kind of deflection or proper deflection, not you know a ball hitting the head pin and going the opposite direction. You want it hitting the head pin and kind of going straight back. Yeah. So that's most of the time when the ball's hooking at your feet, it's just kind of dead and flat the rest of the way down the lane. And that can also go for when it's not hooking enough. If you have something that doesn't get started early enough, so burn up and not enough hook can kind of look the same way if you're throwing like a tropical storm or something and it's just spinning and then jerking late and hitting flat, it's not hooking enough versus, but then that would be okay. Well, I don't have enough ball. Yeah, the ball's just burning up. In the that's when you have to know the strength of the equipment. That would definitely be a well. That's just not enough ball if it's going too long and hitting flat. I need more hook. Well, if I have something that does hook a lot and it's still it's flat and not making the corner, it's like well, it's probably hooking too much. A lot of that experience, you'll learn a lot of that with just experience. Just the more and more you get out there and do it. So mm -hmm. when people talk about a big, a big ball. ball. The way block is actually more centrally located or smaller. Well, usually when they talk about a no. big ball, they're talking about a stronger piece. Yeah, well, they're, yeah, they're talking. Uh, it's not that the weight block is more centrally yeah. located. It's talking about the weight is more centrally located. Um, the weight block is always going to be in the center of the core, uh, but the weight block is or the the weight is more centrally located. You're going to have rounder looking core shapes most of the time or we were going to have a ball that is is a denser ball that's more centrally located if you look at like the high road core that ball that kind of dense core ball is more at the top of is, is closer to the top of the weight block versus like the wild streak and that's why I was, that's actually opposite of what i was saying about the the wild streak is that it was um it's still a very high RG core, but the core itself is smaller and there's a central ball in the middle of that core, which is more in the middle of the ball. So they did kind of adjust a little bit. Technically it's higher RG, but it does rev and roll a little bit sooner than something like a high road because more of the weight is still centrally located. Yeah. But when they're talking about a big ball, they're talking about something that has a stronger core and stronger cover. So when somebody says big ball, they're meaning something that hooks a lot. So it's actually exactly the opposite of that. The weight block is always going to be centrally located, uh, but it depends on where the weight is at. So a lower RG is going to put more of the overall weight closer to the center of the ball and a higher RG is going to have, is going to spread it out a little bit more. Um, I got an Axiom Pearl for Christmas thing about buying the parallax effect. Is there a big enough difference? I don't even have the effect yet. So I don't, I don't know. Well, seen, uh, and what did James say? Yes, James Walker. I think it was you. Yes, there is a motive channel in the discord. Yep. It's called motivated. Yeah. 
Yeah, I tell my buddy that the motive thrill will carry down just as much oil as the low diff urethane because the core has an 18 diff. Yeah, with a, with an 018 yeah. diff, it's just not flaring a whole lot, and mm -hmm. so you're not going to have you're not going to have any separation on those flare rings. So it's going to roll over the same oil tracks yep. all the way down the lane, and that's kind of the idea with like the pitch black or uh, something of that nature. The core is a big part of creating that typical urethane reaction because something like a black widow urethane lock would hook the entire lane with that thing because it flared the thrill and so no the uh, um black widow urethane. oh okay okay <clears throat> he hooked the whole lane with it because it's got an 050 i i think the gas mask is asymmetric too so yeah it's got it's it's got an 050 something diff and an intermediate differential yep. which is the asymmetry that we'll talk about here in a second after we get through some of these it would actually carry what new motive. Yeah. The, the motive channel is actually in our, in our discord. discord and I yeah. think it's one of the Patreon channels too. So you have to be, it's, it's a private channel within, so it's a members only thing. So it's not like you can't just sign up for free and join our motive channel. Uh, you have to actually sign up for Patreon, but there is a motive channel within our kind of private Patreon channels. So, um, I guess if, if you have any motive questions, you can hit me up on Facebook too. I mean, yeah, if we're yeah, not friends, yeah. you can have me on Facebook. Yeah, Just Jonathan Hawes. And he's got he's got a bowling. I also uh, have a bowling, yeah, a bowling page, page too, too at Jonathan so. Hawes Bowling, so you can always hit me up and message me whatever. So. so, what's the best way to begin to understand when you need to ball change to something with a particular RG or diff compared to what you're already throwing? That's a good question too. Yeah, and that's that's where something like. Uh, Storm plays Mr. Potato Head with a bunch of stuff. So now with the new NEX cover stock, we've had it on a big asymmetric. We've had it on a big symmetric, and now we have it on a high road. So if you have something, and you can step, even though it's got the same cover stock, you can step down in strengths because the stronger the core is, the earlier and the more the ball is going to want to hook. So, so core does play a pretty big effect or, you know, play a pretty big part in a ball's overall motion because you can see when you have the proton and the axiom and the high road max all together, you can see a fairly sizable difference. The the uh, physics, the proton, is going to be the strongest one out of all of them. It's going to hook the earliest. And it the that and the NEX creates a very distinct look on the lane. So all of them have about the same friction response. Mm -hmm. So they all have very similar looks on the back end. I don't think that one really has any more back end than the other. Um, I think I've got the Proton a tick slower than the Axiom. You still have it out of box? Is. Yeah, yeah. And all of them, all of them come at 2,000. Uh, but the Proton is going to be the most aggressive overall. And so when that ball starts... Bigger hooking balls need oil to get them down the lane. That's the whole point of having a bigger hooking ball is to be able to dig through heavier oil volumes. Mm -hmm. Just because you have a bigger hooking ball, it's not necessarily there is a time when it's going to burn up or be too much. If you're using a big hooking, or again, if you put snow tires, uh, Proton's 2K, Axiom, and High Road Max or 3K, okay. Um, but if you put snow tires on a stock car, they're just going to get chewed up. Mm -hmm. there you're actually going to get so much less traction than you think that you're getting because you're not using them on the intended surface or it's like taking a, a driver on 150 yard par three you're going to shoot it i mean if you actually hit the ball harder than i mean i guess you can be soft with it yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> another thing too that people don't understand is like if you're bowling a sweeper or something like that and as you're moving left and they're starting to dry up why do people pull out stronger bowling balls. Sometimes they'll pull out stronger solids again. Yeah. And, and it's to create, you know, yeah. Slows down. Yeah. If you're on a, if you're on a heavier or if you're on a house shot, you start moving into heavier volume. So sometimes you want weaker stuff as you move left. Sometimes you want stronger stuff as you move left. Yep. Because if you're on a house shot, the heavier volumes are towards the inside of the lane. And so as you start moving left because of track burn, well, you're just moving into heavier volumes of oil. And in, in addition to opening up your angles, yep. um, but on the, on the uh, the golf club thing, it'd be like somebody taking a driver on 150 yard par three and can constantly hitting it over the green and hitting it over the green. It's like, man, this thing's a piece of junk. It just keeps hitting the ball too far. It's like, well, you're in the wrong club, but it's a lot more obvious to tell in golf than it is in bowling when you're in the wrong ball. And people just automatically assume, well, a ball that hooks more yeah. is going to cover more boards. And that's not 
anywhere close to the, you have to match up the ball to the lane surface unless you're trying to do one of those big brain things and use a stronger ball on drier, shorter patterns, counting on the ball to burn up and stop hooking. If, if I'm playing golf with somebody and they pull out a driver on 150 yard par three, I'm probably going to die laughing. Yeah. So if, a, say, the Axie, you start off a league set with the Axiom and it's looking, you know, it's looking great. That's obviously the ball for the night or for the set or for the condition. Most of the time, um, the better bowlers will try to stick with that ball as long as possible. But the high road max is so if the axiom, say, starts hooking too early. So it's, it starts hooking too early and you move in a little bit. Well, then it's, it's still early, but and now it's a little bit flat because you've opened up angles. Then you can drop down to something like the high road max that's got the same cover stock because it's going to give you a somewhat similar look, but that core is going to not start up near as soon. So when it hits friction, it's not going to, the ball itself is not going to want to hook so much or so early. So the ball is naturally going to want to push further down the lane because it's got a higher RG. So it's not going to rev. It's not going to rev up so soon. It's not going to roll so heavy. It's going to naturally want to get further down the lane. So that can offset the, uh, the friction in the track. So that's one of those things where you can step down from the axiom if the axiom is getting too early, but you like that general look, right. step down to something with the same cover stock, but a different core to help push the ball further down the lane and kind of balance things back out. With experience too, this is stuff that people learn <clears throat> as they go. Oh yeah. We're so yeah. Yep. Thanks Scott. Discord and Patreon's the best. Yeah. We get conversations and, um, I've got a bunch of, I haven't posted so much on Patreon anymore because we have newer people joining and Patreon is a glorified Facebook feed. And so the more I post, the more it buries the old stuff. Yeah. And so Scott can tell you, he has actually gone back and read a lot of that stuff. And there's a lot of good stuff back on the Patreon that I just don't want to bury with, with dumb posts now. And so with the, uh, I'm kind of trying to let people catch up, so to speak. So it's a lot of fun. How often do you recommend cleaning your bowling balls as I mean, whenever they get dirty or you, you know, you do it after every set, just do regular maintenance, get all the junk off of it. Every the, set I clean mine. Yeah. Keep the oil from soaking in too much because the more oil that soaks into the ball, it's it eventually it's going to get oil soaked and you're going to have to get it back out some somehow. So, okay. A while back, uh, the PBA had an issue with the purple hammer being too soft and started testing them. What does that do in regards to ball reaction? A ball that is softer, yes, uh, James answered that down here. Softer equals wider pr footprint equals more traction equals oh. earlier hook. They actually used to soak, they call balls uh, soaker balls or whatever. They actually used to soak ball in like the 70s and 80s. They would take them and soak them in acetone overnight. Yeah. They did all yeah. kinds of things to kind of get around. They would either soak them in acetone or if the ball was, or if the lanes were hooking too much, they'd soak the ball in ice water to harden it up. They did all kinds of crazy nonsense that doesn't sound like way back in the idea. day. But yeah, they used to soak the balls in acetone to soften the cover up to make the ball actually hook more. And sometimes they said the ball would even get deformed if they left it in there too long. Well, yeah, I would think so. <laughs> the ball would get deformed. But yeah, they did. You, they used to do all kinds of things, but they have a certain, the, the PBA has hardness limits or a, a, a basement. I don't know if they have a ceiling. Well, it was USB-C that tested them, it wasn't the PBA. It was when yeah. they pulled the open and mm -hmm. the USB-C raised that red flag. Yeah. Yes, they have, they have, they test, they do random inspections after terms too. So. But yeah, the, the purple hammer got too soft. It went actually, they were softer below the drum and it's nothing that, it's nothing that anybody did to those balls. It's just, they found out. And this is something you can't really tell when you're doing R and D on a ball and you have, you only are working with it for so long. You have to have durability longevity tests. Yep. But when a ball is out and it gradually gets softer over time, that's nothing that they design or having, because then they come into this type of problem. Mm -hmm. It just like the, uh, the original, uh, Jackal. Oh, heck yeah. $5. Oh, yeah. Jeremy Scott. Just want to say the winter, winter solid is, was a great ball. Never got the love it should have gotten. Yeah. The winter solid was just boring and the winter was kind of hit or miss with people. And so that's kind of what happens sometimes. Phase two almost was a miss because, everybody was kind of so, so on the phase. Okay. And so it's kind of like the spec thing. It's like uh, people weren't really sure about it on the prime. And so when the pro motion come out, it's like, Nope, spec, we're done. Not doing it. The winter solid was basically a torrent. 
And the Torrent was another kind of rocket ship-like ball. The Torrent came out with the Timeless. Nobody paid any attention to it. The Winter Solid didn't really have great shelf appeal. And so it, you know, it was just kind of a boring looking ball. And I don't, Winter wasn't necessarily the, as far as a name goes. I actually like the Winter. I, I, I like I liked the Winter for the first game in League. After that, whenever I had to move around with it, it just didn't really work out. But so... Um, so yeah, the with the purple hammer being too soft, it just creates too much friction and actually widens the footprint. Which when they say widens the footprint, that actually creates more surface area in contact yeah. with the lane because the ball is softer. It's not soft. I mean, a bowling ball is still pretty hard, even when it. But they have minimum at least. I don't know if they have maximum because. I mean, when you turn a ball into a marble like a plastic ball, I think plastic balls are like 84 to 87 on the on the durometer. Yeah. And I think the basement is something in the high 60s or something like that. But the Purple Hammer started testing out like 62, 59. If you've got your hands on one of the soft Purple Hammers, don't let it go. Just hold on to it. Yeah, yeah. Because it'll be worth some, some High value. Yeah. Yeah, the Black Widow felt like it would dig a hole in the lane when I threw it. The thing was early. Yeah, the Black Widow urethane, I think, is what you're talking about. Um, yeah, and the, the black, yeah, the widow core is 250, 250, 058, 020. So, so the intermediate differential, we'll talk about that too, since we were talking about RG and differential, the intermediate differential is basically a third, uh, asymmetry. So it's not, it's not something that is a symmetric core is not symmetric from top to bottom. When they're talking about symmetric, they're talking about all the way around. So this is definitely not symmetric at no, all that would but you take something like that this would be symmetric so if you turn it all the way around the dimensions from side to side don't change at all and so that's why they say that on a yep. on a symmetric ball you don't need the the drilling angle or the uh, uh the second number in the the vls uh, pin buffer system because it doesn't matter you know if you have the if you're drilling the pin above the fingers, it literally doesn't matter where the CG is, especially not anymore. And the mass bias is I mean, located by the thumb on asymmetrical balls too, isn't it? Uh, no, it, that can go all okay. over the place, and that's what we're going to talk about. But on, on symmetrical balls, as long as you get within that no three ounces of side weight thing, it doesn't matter where the CG goes because the ball is it's literally the same. Let me go find something here. Just, uh, I can. I need water anyway. <clears throat> what you looking for? Uh, just looking for something symmetrical. He's looking for something symmetrical. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Just looking for something symmetrical. So, so you have this can. This is like a symmetrical. This is like a like a. Uh, this is also very fabulous too. I mean, uh, pineapple bubbly. But when you're taking something like an IQ, and the pin the pin is on the top here, you put the fingers below the pin. All that you're doing with the drilling angle or the second number in the drilling angle dual for dual angle or the second number for the VLS slash pin buffer system, all you're doing with that is turning it side to side. And there's literally no difference. You can keep turning this from side to side all day long. The dimensions don't change. So there's nothing that actually changes with drilling a symmetrical ball, whether the CG is kicked out a little bit or whether it's stacked or whatever. And people look at the people look at that and kind of go, oh, well. Uh, you know, I don't do well when the CG is stacked and get kicked out. It literally makes zero yeah, difference. Make zero difference because all you're doing is you're taking this and you're turning it a little bit. It does nothing changes. There's no difference. But what you do on something like an asymmetrical yeah. ball, yeah. then you introduce. Check out my snazzy phone case. Fantastic. It's pink and sparkles. But so when you're when you take something like this, so you have. Um, so you have from something else, even your mouse, uh, it's symmetrical. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not really. Uh, no. Cause if you, yeah, if you do okay. this, so taking a mouse, so from something that's asymmetrical from top to bottom. So when you change the pin position, you kind of tilt the core basically. Yeah. You tilt the core with a layout. So if it's, if you, you know, have a stronger layout, it's going to put it at a, like a 45 degree angle. So as it turns, it's going to, you know, you have some, you have weight kind of flipping and going all over the place. So that creates a little bit of flair. The idea behind asymmetric bowling balls is that they are also a, that they are also asymmetric from side to side. So as you tilt it and as you turn, you know, as you drill like that, that PSA, 
the easiest way to think about it is the PSA is a second pin because you're basically creating the same thing. That's harder to kind of illustrate or to think about because not only are you having introducing asymmetry from top to bottom, you're introducing it from side to side. So that is that extra, that intermediate differential, which most of the time goes from about 010 to 020. I don't know what the limits on that are, but a lot of these low intermediate differential balls like the Rubicon that's like 011 and the Insight that's 013 that they're starting to introduce, those are to kind of mimic a ball with a weight hole. And that's the whole point of a weight hole number one is that you would drill into the core in a certain location to introduce a little more ace. Any, anytime you drill a symmetrical ball, it's going to become asymmetrical if you're drilling into the core, which you always drill into the core unless you're drilling super crazy short yep. stuff. Um, so all symmetrical balls become asymmetrical, but they also say that the final or the, the mass bias kind of then becomes the thumb wherever that's drilled at. I think most of the time it wants to migrate itself to the thumb. But when you have an asymmetrical ball that already has a natural mass bias or a preferred spin axis, basically, um, you introduce more asymmetry, which is going to make the ball want to flare even more. And then you can get into RG planes and um, track migration and all kinds of stuff, which is way that would be something I'd have to have Chad McLean on for or something to explain. But again, the best explanation of all of this um, about core stuff and uh, Storm did those PSA or the pin buffer layout system videos that's still the best thing you just watch those until you understand that's the easiest way to easiest way to go about it thanks again jeremy for the donation uh can i respond to that? yeah probably yeah exactly frank frankie said that you recently they had the hardest time shooting on half shots and steve williams sold them on a half shot you had to ball up as you move left because of the heavier oil and yes that's the that's the kind of backwards thinking is that number one you're moving left because the ball's hooking too much so you wouldn't think okay well i need to move up and ball left but there's higher volumes of oil in the middle of the lane so sometimes you have to ball up or just stay with the same ball that's why most of the time in league i really don't want to switch balls because if it's already the ball for the night it's something that as I move left, I'll just stick with the same ball instead of trying to switch balls or, uh, you know, most people want to, or they have trouble moving or they're not used to moving. And so once the lanes start hooking too much, it's like, well, I need to go get a different ball. Well, then you, even if you're familiar with what all your different <clears throat> equipment does, you may not, it's, it's going to take a couple shots to kind of get lined back up. But once you use the same ball, you can just kind of move around. And already well, a lot of it. people also think too, as you start moving left, that immediately means you got to go grab weak stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's also misunderstood too. Yeah. Most, that's not always the play. No, it's not always the play. And sometimes the weaker stuff is going to be less reactive through the front part of the lane and more reactive on the back end. But that's when you balance that's that gets balanced out by the more friction on the lane. Sometimes that weak stuff really hooks too. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're friction. That's what it's designed to do. It's designed to hook on dry lanes. Yep. What just like heavy, heavier oil stuff is designed to hook like on, yes. on uh, heavier condition lanes. So it's not about board coverage or friction response or whatever else is about matching up the ball to the lane conditions that are out there. And because it's all invisible, it's something that you have to read and watch with your eyes. There's a lot of people that well, all, all bowling balls now look the same. They just go down and hook. Well, it's like if you're, that means that you're not watching. A lot of people just watch and see what the ball does when it turns. They don't watch anything else. They don't watch the nuances about how much it slows down, how early it starts reacting, how late it reacts, how they just look for back end sharpness. Mm -hmm. And that's their only difference in bowling balls like well this one's a little bit smoother than this one it's like well no that's didn't that doesn't begin to scratch the surface of what's going on here um, so yeah i don't i don't yeah. know the answer on the board can they just sponsor you now with the number of times you mentioned bubbly yeah I mean, you can if you want to touch that oh uh, yeah he's the one that brought some yeah else up the new me. cell phone core coming <laughs> when it comes to the dj yeah. and storm stuff man i'd probably yeah. would go that over to him yeah i want to say you guys are the best yes we are thank you rock on <laughs> my question is I'm considering the deviate Hellraiser return or the high road max. Uh, any thoughts as the choice? Well, I think those are going to be quite different because the original Hell Hellraiser, I think was a big symmetric 
big, strong symmetric ball from DV8, and I'm pretty sure that that one is the same. And the high road max, are, that's got a higher RG, and so that's going to want to go further down the lane. So those are pretty different bowling balls. It would be like comparing an Axiom to a high road or high road max. They're going to have similar cover stock strengths, but the cores are actually quite different. I think the Hellraiser is going to want to be earlier and stronger overall than the max is. It really just depends on what you're wanting to see. Yeah, and so that's – so in – now that we've explained RG and differential and intermediate differential somewhat, um, going back to what Joe asked earlier about how do you know what you need to use and when you need to use it, higher RG balls are naturally going to get down the lane easier. They're going to resist revving and rolling a little bit more. And so Angel looks really good with her high roads because she's got a slower ball speed and kind of medium-ish revs. And so having something that's not – that doesn't want to hook so early or so much helps the ball actually get down the yeah. lane. Now, consequently, if you have something that's, so if you had the, because the high roads have a higher RG, but they have a higher differential too. So they're going to flare a whole lot, but they're going to get further down the lane so that right. when they get further down the lane, they're still going to be pretty consistent on the back end because they have a high amount of flare and having a high amount of flare, which is something I don't think I touched on, the higher the flare you have, the more it separates those oil rings. And so the more fresh cover that you're exposing to the ball on every rotation, that's the idea of having something flare in the first place. So if you have something that the flare lines are really close together, it's going to really elongate where those flare rings cross. Next time you throw the ball, just pick it up and look exactly what's going on with the oil ring. So you're going to have right by your fingers, you're going to have oil ring, oil ring, oil ring, oil ring. But then if you look on the top of the ball, there's a section where they're going to intersect. So the rings are going to cross both on top and on the bottom. Those are called the bow ties. And the less the ball flares, the longer those bow ties are going to be. And so that's where, where the ball, where the rings crisscross, the longer those are, the more, um, the more carry down that you're going to create on the lane and the less, you know, the ball is going to keep rolling over those same oil tracks. And so it's not going to be able to get as much grip because there's already oil on the ball. The more a ball flares, the more the core changes orientation. That's where we get into RG planes and stuff that I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> but um, the more fresh cover it exposes on every rotation and the less oil the ball is going to roll over on every rotation. Now, can by the question that I'm sure somebody might have in mind here. Now, if I drill a ball a certain way, is it going to cause it to flare more or less? Yes, because uh, part of it is changing the orientation of the core, but most of the idea is that you are changing the core numbers. That's when it comes to pin, pin down versus pin up. Yep. So if you have, uh, if you have a pin, that's why you see like the pros with so many of these tall pins that are like really like two or three inches away from their fingers. Yeah. They are trying to take as much material out of the side of the core as possible. So if you take more material out of the side of the core, you're basically reshaping it. You're making it a little bit narrower and a little, you're not actually, you're making it narrower, which in a sense also makes it a little bit taller, which creates a bigger difference between the height and the width of that core. So what you're going to do is you're going to lower the RG and yeah. you're going to raise the differential on, on something that's pin up when you're taking more material out of the side of the core. When you go pin down, you're taking more material out of the top of the core, which is going to make it shorter in effect and a little bit wider, which is going to raise the RG. It's going to spread the weight out a little bit more. And it's also going to lower the differential because there's not as much difference between the height and the width of the core anymore. And so the on on a pin down ball, which people always used to say it roll that makes the ball roll earlier and smoother. It doesn't make it roll earlier; it just makes it smoother. Yeah. It actually makes it go further down the lane, but then it makes it smoother when it gets there. Yep. So, um, but that once you have the the cover stock and the surface are really really um, dominant, and so you're not going to take. Most people think that well. I want this ball. It's like, well, that hooks more than you're going to want it to hook. And we'll probably talk layout. We'll probably get more into layouts next week. That'd be fun. But um, some people, well, can't you just drill it different? It's like not that different. Yeah. I mean, it's, 
it you can't really change it. If you have a certain engine in a car, you can tune it a little bit, but you're still going to have that <laughs> like same engine. If you have a strong bowling ball, it's going to be strong no matter what you yeah, do. Yeah, it's going to be strong. You're it's not going to be, be strong in a different way. You can't turn yeah. a UFO yeah. into a phase three with a layout. That's not going to happen. The phase three it is, is designed to fly. Yeah. And that's why I, in my video, even going pinned down on mine, it still, you know, covered the whole freaking lane on my mm -hmm. right handed phase three video. And even when, if you go back and look on my idle synergy review, my lefty phase three is drilled pin up with a very strong pin with a four inch pin and it's still flippy. So I drilled it very, very strong to flare a whole bunch and it's still flippy, even with an earlier, not necessarily smoother, but an earlier and stronger, yeah. uh, earlier and stronger layout. We'll talk again. We'll talk more about that next week. Good here. With the symmetrical ball doesn't, with a symmetrical ball, doesn't it still matter where the PSA, I just lost that. Yeah. Where, where the, the PSA, PSA to PAP is, I get that it looks the same all the way around, but does it change the position of the core and therefore change reaction? No, a lot of people don't even, it does not matter because what you're, what you're doing, it's easier to lay out a ball if you just go on ahead and put the PAP number on there yeah. or the, the, the PSA to PAP number on there, but it literally does not matter because all you're doing with PSA to PAP is you're taking the, taking the core and you're spinning it. Yep horizontally so it, it doesn't it doesn't change the orientation of the core at all whatsoever so a lot of people don't even add that number when they're talking about it they'll just say well i drilled this five by 70 or i drilled it five by 40 or i drilled it um and the, or they'll say in the psa or the the vls slash uh, pin buffer system they'll just say the pin to pap and the pin buffer number and just completely leave the other one out of it because it literally doesn't matter the only thing that it matters for is in Diesel. making side weight stuff legal. Yep. So as long as you don't have over three ounces, it doesn't matter whether, you know, whether the CG is right in the palm or whether all the way over here. Right. Literally doesn't matter at all because all you're doing is just spinning side to side. Yeah. Man, Jeremy's just dropping all kinds of stuff on us. Thanks, man. Um, also, if anyone is in North Carolina, shout out to Before the First Frame, Henderson, North Carolina. Chris Hahn saved the only local bowling alley in the middle of a pandemic. Sweet. Um, James awesome. James good. is in North Carolina. Raleigh. James is in Raleigh. I yeah. don't know where Raleigh is in relation to Henderson, but. Yeah, shout out to Chris Hahn. That's awesome. Very cool. Yeah. I think I said it wrong. Yeah. Make sure I didn't, been sure I didn't miss any questions here. I've been trying as you're. Given the explanations, I'm trying to catch their questions here. Yeah, Chris Strong answered it. Yeah, the pin to PSA oh. is basically spinning the ball, and a symmetrical ball will always be the same all the way around. That's why the pin to PSA doesn't matter. It's the same way all the way around. But when you do have something that is asymmetric from side to side or horizontally, that's what that's where they say just basically consider the PSA a second pin when you're drilling stuff. You know, it's a food ball. <laughs> yeah, I noticed. Yeah. So yeah, that's why it doesn't matter at all. But on an asymmetric ball, as you spin that core, it does change slightly from side to side. Yeah. It does in introduce a little bit more, a little bit less asymmetry from side to side. So that's why the PSA really does matter. And that's why asymmetrical balls are actually a thing. And that that's probably the easiest way to explain it. We would not, if, symmet if the PSA to pat on a symmetrical ball mattered, we would not meet, need asymmetrical balls. True. That's because really there's true. no, yeah. there would be no differentiation between right. a symmetrical ball and an asymmetrical ball. So that's why symmetrical or asymmetrical balls introduce horizontal asymmetry, not just vertical asymmetry. Just amazing. To, yeah, to get complete, yeah, to go, get completely years. technical and make your brain do all this stuff. Because at some certain point, it's hard to explain it in, I guess, blue collar terms. Again, the easiest thing is the. Find Storm's pin buffer layout system videos and just watch those until it makes sense. Because Alex does a great job showing everything. He's got several ball models on there. He's got spinning where they put several different layouts on them and they just isolate one thing. They'll have everything else the same, but they'll change the pin to PSA or the pin to pin to pad. And then they'll change the PSA to pad. They have some symmetrical balls. They have some asymmetrical balls. They have, they will show you the differences in how the ball, how the core numbers change versus a pin up layout versus a pin down layout and all kinds of different things. So the P the, they did a remarkable, ridiculous job. Alex Hoskins put in all kinds of work and did just such a ridiculous job with those pin buffer layout system videos. 
watch all those again just watch them until they make sense because that's the best just the bait no i don't think um chris i don't think that you i don't think you said it wrong did pin to p oh yeah well yeah. pin to ps yeah it's it, it it all starts with a P. Pin to PSA, pin to PAP. I know what oh, you meant. You yeah. meant pin to pin to PAP, um, or the PSA to PAP. Yeah, I I I've mixed I mixed that up the whole freaking time here. I keep saying the, but yes, the PSA to PAP is it's basically early, all right. Yeah, <laughs> the PSA to PAP is basically spinning the ball. And when you're taking this and spinning it, you're not going to change. It's not going to change dimensions. Or it's, there's nothing to there's nothing to change. There's nothing to affect. But Oh, yeah, I'm pulling the putting money summer league up there and start to make. Yeah. All right. Well, those are kind of the we're about at our end of time and uh, uh, morning bolt is about to start on Facebook. If you want to go check that out, um, head over one, to bowlinglabs.com. Get your heck and urethane t-shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually I showed those off last week. Yep. Oh, and a small note about the belts that I showed off last week. So two weeks ago. Yeah. No, two weeks ago. Yep. So I think I explained that last week then. You can't actually buy those. They don't. That was a prototype that had the bolt on those belts. Now those belts are still ridiculous at grip6.com. Yeah, they are pretty cool. And you can you can just cut off the. All you do is they send you a longer belt and you just cut it off the right length mm -hmm. and then use a lighter or some fire or something to just kind of cauterize the end of it back up. There it is. And so if you're lose if you're use uh, if you're losing weight or something, yep. and you have problems with belt, you don't have to replace the belt. You can just cut more off the end of it. And it's a very simple, very durable. Yeah, they're strong. They're strong. Very simple, sure. very durable, good belts, but you're just not going to get them with the bolt logo. I think James says he wears them. Yeah, James already wears them. And you're just not going to get them with the bolt logo on there because they're not. That's not. They're not authorized equipment or whatever. They didn't get authorized to use that logo. So. Hey, I've been looking away. Confirmed. They still work. Huge fan of Grip Six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the other thing is Jim's or Jim, yeah, there it is, right James. There. That's still Jim. James. Jim Rucker put in the uh, Jimmy Jim, Jimmy Jim. Yeah. He put in the link for Luke's merch in there. You got the heckin' your thing pad or the shirts, the hoodies, zip up or pullover, as well as the panda pack patches. Yeah, which helps support you, the local dog say, rescue. If you buy a panda pack patch, what does it do? It supports our local positive tales KC dog rescue that we uh that we help foster and fundraise for. And we actually say with uh, last year we raised forty two hundred dollars. Forum, exactly. which actually saved a couple dogs' lives. So you guys saved some, saved some dogs' lives, with because they needed some expensive surgeries. And a lot of the time, yep. if somebody says, "Hey, it's going to cost fifteen hundred dollars to save your dog," versus a thirty dollars shot, I mean, sometimes people just have to take the thirty dollars shot because they don't have fifteen hundred dollars to save their dog. So yep. we actually saved a couple. Couple puppers, and don't forget to join so, the Discord as well. Yeah, the Discord's a lot of fun, and the Patreon thing, like I said, is five dollars a month, and it only charges the first of the month. So if you want to sign up and check it out, you basically get a free preview yeah. if you sign up after the fifth, because it stops. It, the payment period is from the first to the fifth. Yep. So if you signed up, if you signed up right now, today is the twelfth. You'd have all the way to the first of next month to kind of preview it for free, basically, if you want to sign up. So, like we said, if you're in the Patreon and you're in the Discord as well, there's several other ex extra channels in there that include, you know, dogs, yeah. pups, and food and nutrition. Motive. The Motive Channel. Motive Channel, come and hang out with, come and hang yeah. out with us over there. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. We also have a marketplace. Yes. Or trading your own equipment internally. It kind of helps with, I mean, if you're trading, trading with somebody on Facebook, you don't really know, I mean, who you're dealing with sometimes. But if you're in the marketplace, it's only from, it's a members only thing. And so you should know, or, you know, I have all, I'll have all the information for them. So if a deal goes wrong, then I know where to find them and track them down. Yep. So it's all a, a little more trustworthy. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little there. secure. Yeah, it's a little bit more secure deal. Pretty much everybody that's in there knows talks to each other. Yeah, sometimes. and then we have a tournaments channel too, yep. where people can put local tournaments and whatever else. So, I think we're gonna sign off on this one. Um, we will talk more. We'll do this several several times. I'll have several more Denzel Washington photos <laughs> in the thumbnails. So yeah, um, basically, if you're coming in later here, um, start the video over. We talk about some basic stuff to start, and then we get into what RG and differential and intermediate differential. We got a little bit on cover stocks, but we'll probably go into cover stocks next week because there's a whole that's a whole big 
this whole big can of worms. We talk about cores today. We'll probably talk about cover stocks next week. Cover stocks week. And, and layouts or something? Yeah, yeah. We touched on layouts a little bit. Yeah. Lay, core, yeah, yeah, cores yeah. and layouts go hand in hand here, but uh, we'll talk a little bit more about um, cover stocks next week and probably have time to start getting into layouts and how the whole package actually fits together. So Sounds like fun. Come hang yeah. out with us. Yep, and it probably won't be at 8.30 because I think that's when we have our uh, – I'll let you sleep in a little bit. So. Oh, I wouldn't. <laughs> Vacation. We, yeah, we have a tax appointment next Friday, so it won't be. It'll probably be something like 11 o'clock or something. It's fine. Yeah. A luncheon stream. How about that? Yeah, yeah. I promise I won't sit here and stuff my face while we – Or maybe we can have some uh, adult beverages. I got, Ooh. Some, I got some good stuff hanging I'll, out. So. I'll be on vacation. So. Yeah, yeah, there you go. I'm off on Fridays anyway. Yes. So. <laughs> All right. Thanks, thanks. everybody. Yeah, have a great weekend. Yep, yep. We'll uh, see you next time.